Good morning, Simon. Morning, Cassie. How are you and where are you? Well, I'm at home deep in the English countryside and um, in some respects enjoying the lockdown. Um, well, it's not really a lockdown any longer. Um, of course, one feels terrible about all the suffering, but on the other hand, it's just everything slowing down. It's given all of us an opportunity to think really hard for the first time in months and years. I think in many respects, it, it has been good. I totally agree with you. I think the lockdown, of course, uh, we have lost many, many lives to COVID-19. And a lot of people are still struggling in the hospitals. Also in Luxembourg, we have a few people still in the intensive care. And, um, you know, numbers are going up. So there is kind of like the assumption that there will be a second wave now. Um, Switzerland has put Luxembourg on the on the blacklist, uh, so on the watch out list. Uh, so yes, I think we need to brace ourselves again. But again, as you said, lockdown to also look at the positives of it in the negative times, in the turbulent times. Um, it really also for myself gave me time a bit to look inwards and kind of reassess our lives, who is in our lives, because I think during lockdown you really understood by not being physically connected to people, by seeing them, who actually is there and who actually keeps in touch if it is not you yourself to, uh, who organizes it or who, um, yeah, who just does it and that was for me that was a big learning so that that was really really great so for the people who do not know simon yet um simon is a dear year-long friend we have connected yeah years ago and i have been observing your path with great um interest and you have inspired me since the day i met you you're really a man of your word you're very loyal as a friend and uh, you are just incredibly inspiring on all of the work you do because the work you do relates to community, relates to sharing good practice, relates to giving back in turbulent times, but also in times where we have a lot of innovation and technology and you make people understand where all of this comes together to kind of like create that puzzle of the future we want to build for our children. Um, so in a nutshell then, uh, how I met you was um, because you are known globally as the founder really of the concept of nation branding, which in itself is mind blowing. Just when I heard that for the first time, I was just so honored to see you because nation branding, whoever listens to this right now knows the term and uh, that you were the one coming up with it is just absolutely incredible. I do know though that you do not like to be referred like that. Tell us why and what is the concept of nation branding really in your opinion and what was your story behind that term? Well thank you Tessie and thank you very much for that for that lovely introduction. Um, I feel uh, quite embarrassed um, but uh, in a positive way. <laughs> the term nation branding is a, is a term that I've struggled with for nearly 20 years. As a matter of fact, I have to say that the term I think I originally coined back in a, an academic paper in 1998 wasn't nation branding, it was nation brand. And people often say three letters, come on, don't be pedantic, what difference can that make? But it does make a difference because nation brand is just an observation. The countries have got images and those images are incredibly important to them. If you're a country that has a powerful and positive image, Everything is easy and everything is cheap, whether it's getting more tourists, more foreign investment, attracting more talent. Everything is so easy because people think you're wonderful, like Switzerland, for example. If, on the other hand, you have a weak or a negative image, whether it's fair or not, whether it's your fault or not, everything is difficult and everything is expensive. So really, it sounds very obvious and very simple, but that was all I said. I said countries are in some respects a little bit like products or companies. They have this brand image. And if it's good, they're market leaders. And if they're not, it's a nightmare. But somehow over the years, this idea of nation brand kind of morphed. It turned into nation branding, which is a totally different idea. And an idea which actually I've always contradicted. The idea that if you don't like your country's image, you can somehow fix it. You can manipulate it. 
you can change the way people think about your country. You can make them think it's wonderful, even if they think it's terrible. You can make it famous, even though it's uh, not known by anybody. And this is just not true. I've been researching this for, 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 for years and years and years. I've never seen any evidence that that kind of state level propaganda works at all. Countries can spend as much as they want on advertising campaigns and logos and slogans and all that rubbish. It may get them more tourists, but it doesn't change the image of the country. If a country wants to be admired, it has to become admirable. If it wants people to like it and invest in it and visit it and listen to what it says and trust it, then it has to do things that benefit the community of nations. It's as simple as that. Very interesting. And we did um, talk about that in length also because I think uh, we talked about my beautiful Luxembourg as well. We have been uh, put on the gray list quite a lot because of our finances and Luxembourg has been struggling as a country to kind of like uh, bring its nation brand up against the, 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 the stereotype that we are a tax haven and all of these other things. So I do understand very much what you're saying. Um, and I think it's really important that countries understand that. Um, I think what you, I guess what you're saying is that become the leader in what you are the weakest at. Um, what people point fingers at, become the leader in contradicting that in order to make your country really shine, but sustainably, uh, rather than just putting really, as we have the term in the media uh, space, re putting a red lipstick on a pig. So yeah. moving- I mean, that's, that's part of it, but, but the main thing of all, and this is what my research has showed me over the years, is don't brag about how wonderful you are because nobody cares, right? If I don't live in Luxembourg, I don't care how wonderful life is for people who live in Luxembourg because it doesn't affect me. What I care about is what you do as Luxembourg or any other country for the world that I live in. So that's the big discovery, the discovery that actually people don't care about how successful they are, uh, a country is. They care about what it contributes to the rest of humanity and the rest of the planet outside its own borders. So why should I feel glad that Luxembourg exists? I don't want to hear you telling me how wonderful you are. I don't want to see you spending taxpayers' money on, on state propaganda telling me that you've got fabulous castles or a fabulous history, because it doesn't affect me. It doesn't benefit me. What I want to know is, what are you doing about climate change? What are you doing about migration? What are you doing about corruption and transparency? What are you doing about this and about that? And don't tell me, do it. Exactly. No, I, I, I totally am with you and you know that. So um, moving on to the next topic then. So moving on to the next topic then. Um, one really incredible project you're doing as well is called the Global Vote. Tell us a bit about it, because I think we are coming, yeah, the US elections are coming up now. Why is the global vote so important in such an interconnected world we're living in? Well, the global vote uh, was something I launched in, was it 2016? And it's, a, it's an online platform that lets people anywhere in the world vote on the elections of other people's countries. And it sounds like a kind of stupid idea. Why would you be interested in who becomes the president or the prime minister of another country? Well, if it's the president of the United States, you might be interested, even if you live in Germany or Kenya or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And even if it's the president of Germany or Kenya, you might well be interested because it's gonna have an effect on your life. And the idea behind the global vote is that today we live in this super connected, super globalized world. And everything that any country does is going to affect everybody else sooner or later. There's no such thing as national boundaries anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected, whether we like it or not. And so the person and people who end up running a country will have an impact on our lives. And so will every vote we take. I mean, Brexit, for example. Only British people were allowed to vote for the UK leaving the European Union. But the decision has affected and will continue to affect everybody in the European Union and beyond. So in a funny kind of way, that's not very democratic if you think about it. At a global level, it's completely undemocratic. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that everybody in the world should vote for the next president of the USA. And I know that literally most countries make that illegal. There are very, very stringent tests on citizenship. You're only allowed to vote if you're a citizen and all the rest of it. But symbolically, it's very, very valuable indeed because it helps us to get an idea that there is 
another group of people out there, the rest of the 7 billion members of humanity, who might care how you run your country and whose lives it might affect. So basically what happens is, every time there's an election in any country all around the world, and I particularly like the really small ones, the ones that nobody's ever even heard of, I find them fascinating. Such as, give us an example. Well, one of the earliest ones we did was Sao Tome and Principe, which is a little island state off the, uh, off the west coast of Africa, which uh, is a, a wonderful and interesting place, a pretty small population in the hundreds of thousands. But I wanted to make the point that even Sao Tome and Principe is part of the global community. And when you become the president of Sao Tome and Principe or anywhere else, you join the team that runs the planet, whether you like it or not. So we look very hard at how these people campaign for elections. And it's fascinating because even in the really internationally minded countries like, I don't know, Sweden or Germany or Canada, still elections are run 100% purely on a domestic focus. What am I going to do for you, my citizens, and what am I going to do for our tiny slice of territory? And this is suicidal. The reason why we've got these huge emergencies like climate change and migration and pandemics and all the rest of it is because countries still persist in believing that the only people that matter are their own citizens and the only territory that matters is their own territory. And this is just wrong, wrong, wrong. We need a change in the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. So countries have to stop seeing themselves as competitors or enemies and they have to start seeing each other as partners in the same game. Life on Earth is a team sport. So that's the point that I'm trying to get across with the global vote. It's actually on, on pause at the moment, I'm sorry to say, because I just don't have the bandwidth uh, to be able to maintain all those candidate profiles and cover those elections in a free, fair, transparent, and neutral way. But I really want to get it started again, and I'm, I'm looking for help at the moment to get that going because I'd love to run the next US presidential election and see what happens. It was one of the first ones we did uh, when, I, when I first launched the platform. That's amazing. So if you're listening, you're working in academia, you are even a student uh, looking for something really exciting, um, you're professional, whatever your profile is, you think, I want to be part of this, do get in touch. I put you in touch with Simon or get straight away in touch with Simon. I put all of his details below this video because I think it's really important that we get a global perspective on the leaders that lead, that should be leading the future. So moving on then, there's just so many things and such little time. You keep inspiring me. And just a few days ago, you sent me exclusively your new book, which will be released to the public in August. Tell us about your book. Why is it important? And what do you want to share to the world with your book? Well, the book is called The Good Country Equation, um, subtitled How We Can Repair the World in One Generation. So that's a pretty ambitious subtitle, mm -hmm. but I honestly believe that it's not all that difficult. And one of the things I say in the book is that I love, I revere simplicity, not the simplicity that comes from only seeing the surface of things, but the simplicity that comes from seeing through the surface of things to the simple facts underneath. So this book is important to me because it's the first book I've written in five years. And so everything, pretty much everything I've ever thought about the whole idea of what is a good country, ever since I launched the first edition of the Good Country Index uh, back in 2014, is in this book. Now, there are a lot of books out there about the state of the world, you know, just moaning about how terrible things are. I actually disagree. Uh, yeah, things are terrible, they always are, but things are also great and they always are. I'm super optimistic at the moment about the future of the planet and the future of humanity. I think we're starting to get it. The media tends to focus on the negative because it sells more advertising, yeah. but actually the new generations coming up who are naturally instinctively global in their mindset, I don't think they're going to make the same mistakes that we make. I really, really don't. So anyway, Every time a book comes out moaning about the state of the world or with a new recipe about how to fix our global problems, I buy it because I have to, this is my subject, and I start reading it very enthusiastically, and I get to about page 13, and then I start skipping, and then I get page to page 40, and I start skipping whole chapters, and I never finish them. And it's not because they're not good books. They're great books. They're written by authors who really know their stuff. And I'm lost with admiration for how well they understand politics and economics and trade and sociology. But I just can't read them because they're textbooks. They're written in black and white. 
And you don't want to go back to school at our age and read a textbook again. You want something that's fascinating. So I listened to my friends and everybody said to me, look, Simon, you've advised the presidents and prime ministers and monarchs of 56 countries. Every time you come back from one of these places, you have some crazy news story to tell about the time, you, <laughs> the, time, the time you didn't spill the soup on Vladimir Putin's trousers and so on and so on and so on. And the time you were locked in a lavatory in the royal palace in Bhutan. And these weird things always happen. And my friends have been saying to me for years, just write an autobiography. Just tell the story of all those extraordinary places. And so I came up with a compromise. I said, okay, <clears throat> I'll write the story of the travels and the places and the leaders, and I'll tell everything, and even the funny stories. But I also want to explain how, at the same time, I started coming up with the idea of the good country and figuring out what's really wrong with the world and how we really can fix it. So what it is, it reads more like a novel. You know, it's got a story, it's got characters, it's funny, it's tragic, but it also, I hope, is going to make people think about really where have we gone wrong? And really, how can we go right in the future? That is amazing. Well, I make sure that we put the link below as well for the book once it's out, because I think it is important for everyone to read this. But also at the same time, hey, it's summer. The book comes out in August. It's a perfect beach reading while also actually learning what is happening out there. And if you ever, you know, listening now, if you want to get to know leaders a little bit different, through the eye of Simon, do not miss it because I am sure it promises to be something else. That's for sure. So Simon, we're running out of time. Tell me what next? And also in these turbulent times, you are just always so inspirational and you're always so positive. Maybe that is why I'm so drawn to you because you always smile when I see you when we're driving around with your Tesla. It's just, we're always having a good time, whatever we're doing. So tell us, what makes Simon Simon briefly? And what can you share with us, a glimpse of that positivity? How do you hold on to that continuously? And how can we grasp some sparkles of it? I don't know. I have a, I have a saying which I often repeat, which is, okay, I have to, because of my work, I deal every day with big scary issues and the thing I always say is just because these things are serious doesn't mean they have to be boring there is no obligation to go around with a long face it's not going to make any difference whether we're miserable or whether we're optimistic and cheerful in fact if we're optimistic and cheerful we're much more likely to find the energy to solve some of these problems rather than feeling defeated by them but I also think that it's partly to do with the fact that I'm living in the area and I'm doing the job that I love Ever since I was tiny, I was just fascinated by other countries. I always assumed that people in other countries were going to be more interesting than people in my own country. I always assumed that other people's countries were going to be more beautiful and more special than my own country. <laughs> and so since the age of about two, I've just been drawn to cultural difference. And it's basically because I love people and I love the way that they're all so different. I love the way that we're all so completely hopeless. And yet at the same time, we have a kind of spark of genius in us. And I can't get enough of it. So the work that I do and the stuff that I write about is a subject that for me is the best subject in the world. It's people and the world they live in. And the fact that although we have our flaws, our flaws are what make us interesting. Some of us are really horrible and that makes us interesting as well. How do we deal with that? How do we work together as a team instead of just fighting? That's what fascinates me and it makes me happy. And I'm really, really lucky because I work in an area and I do a job that I absolutely love. And people who can say that, they're, they're really lucky. Beautiful. So what you're saying in a nutshell is do what you love and you don't work a day in your life. Yeah, absolutely right. doesn't feel like work at all. Well, thank you, Simon. I make sure I share all of these things we have discussed in the YouTube video in the copy below. I'm looking forward to talk to you more offline. Um, to everyone else, if you do feel what Simon was talking about. If you do want to help him, if you want to be part of his team, whatever it is that inspires you to make this world a better place. If you have questions, do get in touch um, because only through communication and collaboration can this world become a better place. And Simon is definitely the man for that. So thank you so much, Simon, for your time. I really appreciate it in your busy schedule. I'm looking forward to read your book now. 
and uh, we'll definitely share with you with you and uh, until then there it is exactly i am so excited to read it. <laughs> so um thank you so much and uh, big hugs to your family stay safe and healthy and we do keep in touch offline and i hope to see you soon in person thanks Bessie. thank you so much